if we took one line from the Course, from the immediacy of salvation section, pretty late in the Course, be not content with future happiness, for it is not your just reward, for you have cause for freedom now. So let's just take that one idea, and let's just look at it in a close way, because it must mean that if my mind is preoccupied with these monkey mind chatter thoughts, that they must be, there must be something deeper that, that those thoughts are serving. Why would I keep thinking them unless I believe that it served me to think about those thoughts? And I would say that if you really trace them down, underneath all those thoughts that are whirling around there is a belief that some of these thoughts are very importantly tied in to future happiness. Even though Jesus says, be not content with future happiness, you have cause for freedom now. So then, we're into this idea that somehow we have to manage our story. But why would we even care about managing our story unless we were trying to make it a happy story? And why would we do that unless we believed that it was actually possible to have a happy story? Like the fairy tales, happy endings. You like, well, you know, most people like fairy tales that have happy, happy endings, positive, optimistic. But you see, all those things imply that there is a thing called future happiness, and that somehow we'd be lazy, we'd be slacking, if we're not thinking, okay, got to manage my finances, got to manage my health, manage my body. Not good to have a decrepit body, not very positive. To have a decrepit body, and then, you know, it's, even if you got a healthy body, well, then you better have some finances for that healthy body, because that ain't going to do you a lot of good if you're a, a poor, healthy body. And so, you know, and then you need some excitement too, for that body, even if it's healthy and it's got some money, if it doesn't have any ex stimulation, it's going to be bored, it's going to be dull. So you see, you can start to see all these overlays, and that's what is being thought about. That's where, instead of being still and know that I'm God, like the, we've been told, it seems more attractive to be thinking about these thoughts, like much ado about nothing, that Shakespeare called it. But there must be some kind of an attraction under the thoughts, otherwise we would drop them. We would say, this isn't working. But we must believe that it still is working. Oh, so we would hold on. And that's what makes the filter, that's what we're really getting down to, starting to take a look. Jesus says, the dreams that you think you like can hold you back as much as those in which the fear is apparent. So, it's, it shows you how sneaky this thing is. And everybody's, you know, quick to look at the things that they don't like. And how do I eliminate them from the story? Just give me the story, cleansed and purified of all the negative things, and then I'll have a very positive, happy story. But you know, the story itself is made of the fabric of the ego, and you can take all the black threads out, and you can leave the white threads in, but you still are left with threads. threads. Lots of threads. <laughs> Even white threads are going to block you from the light, because God is no creator of threads. God is the creator of spirit. So it's really, I mean, you can start to see how, how profound this is, then we just come together in willingness and honesty, and we give it over to the Holy Spirit and say, you know, show me where, show me my blind spots, show me my, show me my white threads. I spent years working on my black threads, let's show me some white threads, if they're still holding me back from, from the moment, I want to know. We've been talking a lot about guidance, because a lot of times people even think of guidance as a very linear thing you know, future guidance, future guidance, and did I get the guidance right, and second guessing the guidance, and it's really a mess. It's a lot of guilt over guidance. And then, it's not really, really what guidance is for. If guidance is for peace, and you feel stressed out over guidance, then you know something, the ego's got in there. So what I would say is, you're not, if, if you believe in the ego, you believe in the storyline. And you believe the story is a fact. Like, everything's a fairy tale and the story's just a fact. And then the Course comes in and says, 
At no single instant does the body exist at all. It is always remembered or anticipated. You can see, it's always the past or the future. But at no single instant, not in the holy instant, does the body exist at all. So what you do is you have to go from thinking that the story is a fact to what I would call a guided story. But a guided story doesn't mean that there's a person in the story that's going to get the guidance. It's your mind that needs the guidance, because the problem is the mind believes that it's a body. Mm -hmm. And how is that body going to receive guidance? Bodies don't really get guidance. The mind gets the guidance. The mind that believes it's a body gets the guidance, so that it can loosen up from believing that it's a body. So I'll give you an example of how this works. We have a, a community in Alizena, Spain. It's on the Mediterranean. It's not too far from Malaga, Spain. Beautiful town, tiny little town, beautiful little casa. And we have, I don't know, 12 some people there or something. And they've been working all through the summer and they've been doing collaborative projects, collaborative housekeeping, gardening, going to the village, shopping for vegetables, doing a little gardening. They're just working, learning to how to join together and collaborate and let the spirit move through them. And so, it came to a point here uh, recently where they were guided to make a movie. They all felt it. Every one of them, like all 12 of them said, we're, we're to make a movie. So it wasn't like they had to get a debate on it. They all felt they were to make a movie. And then they started making the movie and they started doing like storyboards and they had a couple cameras. And then they started to come up with some, you know, some narration and some, some things. But it was very spontaneous still. And then a storyline started to emerge, and they were going with it, and they did their first day of filming. And then it emerged who the main character of the movie was to be. It was kind of a given thing. They didn't plan it, but our friend Ludwig from Sweden was to be the lead character. So then after the first day of filming, uh, Francis was telling me, they, they said, okay, now we've got more scenes for you tomorrow to shoot. So. We want you to be, carry over in a natural way, so, in the movie, so when you get up in the morning, don't shave. Because it's going to look really strange from one scene to the next, if you've got a beard, you know, a beard and then no beard. It's just too much, you know, the, the, how they're receiving this movie. So they get up the next day, Ludwig forgets that he's the main character, so he shaves. He comes out, they all go, Ludwig. <laughs> now, is this a problem? No, because they immediately said, what's going on Ludwig? What's going on in your mind? And he was like, hmm, what's going on? I, I forgot, I, I shaved. He said, no, just go, go deeper. And he was like, I don't want to be the lead character. See, in his mind, he didn't want be the lead character, so uh -huh. it wasn't a Freudian slip, it was a, you know, the characters act out our thoughts and desires. He actually shaved because he didn't want to be the lead character. So then they said, okay, who here wants to be the lead character? And then they got one, Anders, um, said, I will be the lead character. I feel called, really, truly, to be the lead character. So they, he becomes the lead character. So they, they film him and everything. He gets so into the emotions and everything, that he forgets it's a movie. It's a movie. He <laughs> so wants to be the lead character, he gets so into the character, that he forgets that he's acting. He completely forgets it. And they had to go, look, they had to go, Anders, Anders, it's, we're filming. He, he, he's lost awareness of the camera, he's lost awareness of the of the movie making process, now he's so in it. And I was telling Francis, so you had to like, cut! Cut! <laughs> like, because you see there's two things going on, but the merge occurs yeah. when we get so into the flow of the moment, and we're so in the moment, that we forget about everything else. We literally forget about everything. We forget about the characters, we forget about everything, and that, that's really what the whole thing was about, was to just, it wasn't about making the movie. It was about just getting so relaxed and so into that guidance and that flow. And that's what we always talk about with guidance. It's not really 
linear. It's just all about being in the moment. That's the only purpose of guidance. It's not, if you follow this guidance you'll get, attract the right partner, or you'll be wealthy, or you can, you can be a famous uh, spiritual teacher. There's no physical linear rewards to this. The fact, the whole point of it is to forget the linear. And that's the reward right there, because you feel the joy of God, the peace of God. Yeah, yeah it's a, an experience of the present joining with the Spirit, and it doesn't matter what the guidance is really saying. So it's not about getting it right or getting it wrong, it's really about joining in the moment with the Spirit. Yeah. And then the Spirit gives us props, like over all mm -hmm. along the way, to stay tuned in with Him. But he's really calling us in a deeper experience that staying attached to the form and thinking that guidance is about the form still. You see how the world's like the world of of time and space is like saying, you know, like atheism is a the belief there is no God. And of course if there is no God then there is no guidance from God. So you're on your own. Just study books and learn things and make decisions and weigh the pros and the cons and analyze and figure it out, man. You know, that's what the world says. Figure it out. Do something with your life. Make something of yourself. Figure it out. And then we're open to this thing called guidance, but not guidance, of, you know, as some separate thing from you, but, but that moment, deep feeling of being totally self-honest, spiritually honest and tuned in in alignment with God. And then, like Armel said, the form is absolutely irrelevant. Absolutely irrelevant. You don't have to justify it. You don't have to prove that it's spiritual or prove that it's guided. You, you are in it. You are it. And then that is the convincing right there. And how beautiful that is to, to be that authentic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the reward is the experience. Really. You know you're following the guidance by the way you feel. So it's not about the form, it's not, but it's just that you will know as you take the steps, yes, I am following what's given me because I feel it. I, I have this spark in my heart, I totally resonate with what I'm living, like I, I am full of joy, I can feel just that the current is carrying me, and all that is really showing you that you are in tune with spirit. And the form is used because we still believe in it. Yeah. And as long as there's a belief in it, the Spirit will use it to undo whatever belief is still there. And whatever construct, whatever character, concept, concept is still held on to. And so the form is irrelevant, but it's going to be used. Yeah. So it's not also saying, oh, if the form is irrelevant, why would I follow the guidance then? But it's just seeing that the guidance is this deeper invitation and by allowing the form to be used the way it's given, then I just I, I stay tuned in this in this experience. And the I that I think I am disappears really in this experience. <laughs>